There's so much history here, so many Australian aviation stories. Welcome to Harz. Oh yeah, I mean, when I first arrived at Harz, this was sitting here looking all forlorn and unloved and the project had stopped. There'd been some people working on it previously and they'd left and it was sitting there not going anywhere. And I said to the president, Bob Delahunty, oh, if that project ever gets going again, I wouldn't mind helping out. And about a year later, he came along to me and said, well, it's all yours, get on with it. I want to see some progress. Good. Uh, not, the wind's not quite as strong as they were yesterday, unfortunately. The overall component is uh, plus 14 knots, and they were plus 19 yesterday, and that makes quite a difference. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, the forecast for the latter stages of the flight at this stage, as far as en route weather goes. We've got a 70729 Z airborne slot. Okay, that should be good. It gives you, you know, 30 odd minutes to, yeah, to get it. It's going to be fairly busy. The highlight of the marketing strategy for the 400 was undoubtedly the record non-stop flight between London and Sydney, which exploited the long-range capabilities of the aircraft to the limit. The route will take the old kangaroo route out of uh, London, down through, the, uh, down through Europe, through the Middle East, down to slightly to the west of uh, India, past Colombo, and then it will swing down across the Indian Ocean to pick up a, an Australian landfall around about Port Hedland, and then take advantage of the winter jet streams which blow from uh, west to east across Australia. It's a great thrill for me as the Australian High Commissioner here in London to be here at Heathrow this morning to saying farewell to those travelling on this very historic flight, the, the longest commercial non-stop flight in the world, performed by Australians, performed by an Australian company, Qantas, performed by Australia. Then it was all systems go. The jet, complete with new look winglets to reduce drag, was towed to the runway to conserve fuel. When the 747-400 left the ground, it was aiming to do what no other commercial jetliner has ever done, fly non-stop for almost 18,000 kilometres to Sydney. Amusingly, going across Germany, um, and they cleared us rather than via airways direct across their airspace, um, there was a, a, a Dan Air DC-9 who claimed he was on a long-range flight uh, with the destination of Crete, which made us laugh. Um, and the German controller came back and said, the flight that has your altitude uh, is going just a little bit further than you are. <laughs> so he was denied. And they, they were generally interested. We were given official greetings from the Yugoslav government, for example, across Yugoslavia. And, and uh, just in, generally, every, Air traffic control helped enormously everywhere, everywhere they could. A famous radio call of yours, you were worried a little bit about pushing a bit of wind. Uh, it was something we didn't talk about too much, but from the time uh, we, we um, I think we climbed to 37,000 feet at Musket in Oman. And from there down towards Colombo, uh, the winds which had already forecast to be headwind, became stronger than the forecast. And by the time we got to Colombo, had those winds persisted, Sydney was definitely not on the cards. Sydney, Australia. A new Boeing 747-400, the latest development of the 747 line, touches down at Sydney International Airport, having flown 18,001 kilometres from London in 20 hours, 9 minutes and 5 seconds, making it the longest non-stop airline flight in history. It gives me great pleasure to formally name this Boeing 747-400 the City of Canberra, 
and may God bless all who travel in her. Thank you. saw Haas for the first time, how'd you feel seeing all those old aircraft, the collection there? <laughs> Staggered um, is a good word. I had no idea, I knew of Haas, but I had no idea how much Haas was doing. Hi, my name's Gareth Evans. In 2014, I was actually the Chief Financial Officer of the, the Qantas Group, and part of that role involved fleet trading, the buying and selling of aircraft within the Qantas fleet. Now, at that time, we were going through a fairly large retirement program for the 747-400s, and a number of, of those aircraft had exited the fleet during that year and, and the prior years. Uh, and OJA had absolutely come to it, the end of its useful life within the Qantas fleet, and we were looking around for a home for it where we could sell it. Um, and one was not um, apparent, and so it had got to the point where the deal had been done to uh, sell the aircraft for scrap flight to the desert in Arizona and then scrap the aeroplane. Um, the document had come down to me, and I actually sat there with it in front of me with my pen poised over it, and I just couldn't bring myself to sign because this aircraft is part of Australia's history. It holds the, the distance record on its delivery flight from down from London to Sydney, uh, and because aviation is such a part of Australian history, this is part of Australia's history. So I spoke to the fleet trading guys again, I spoke to our government affairs people, and actually within a few days, they'd come up with the solution of potentially donating it to Haas, and within a few weeks, I think the deal was done. It was all done very, very quickly. Um, and so I'm very, very proud to be part of the process that has preserved this very, very historic aircraft for for, for all Australians to be able to come and see down on display um, at Haas. This particular aircraft was our first 747-400 and it still holds the record for the longest delivery flight, a little bit over 20 hours in 1989 and to end its career we're going to be giving it the shortest delivery flight. We plan on climbing to only 5,000 feet, which is uh, quite low for our normal flying in the 747. The flying time is just a little bit over 10 minutes. Delahunty very kindly took me for a stroll through the hangars the afternoon of OJA's arrival and I think my eyes must have been out on stalks 
when I saw the magnitude of the tasks they were doing in all sorts of shapes and sizes. And Terry Wilson, 20th of January 1958, two months before I, I was born, you joined the Air Force. That's right. Wow. I was a tender age of 15. Uh, I came from uh, Upper Swan in Western Australia on the Swan Valley uh, from the vineyard. And uh, yeah, my mother put me on the train in Perth and away I went. And about two and a half days later, I arrived at Wagga, the RAF School of Technical Training, to start an engineering apprenticeship for the RAAF. These, you only really told me yesterday. I always thought they were metal. They're not, are they? No, they're not. Uh, the fuselage is made of a, a wood bolster sandwich, uh, which is covered in fabric. Um, and the only metal part of the fuselage is the rear bulkhead and the cross tubes that hold the wings. The wings and the tail assembly are all metal, but yeah. the fuselage is actually wood. And that came about, the, the single-seat fighters started off being wood because they were built during the war. They started building them during the war and where some of the materials in short supply they had already used that construction, wooden construction method on the mosquito very successfully, so they just applied it to the vampire. So they are all engine, they were very light. Yeah, they were, and the, the engine was the very first jet engine that de Havilland built, the Goblin. Um, that was a, it was built by a ma Major Frank Halford, designed it, and he, he went in 1941, went and saw what Frank Whittle was doing, had a look over his shoulder, and went back to his drawing board, and then about a year later, in uh, 1942 he had the first Goblin engine running and the interesting thing that some people don't know is that uh, the Meteor, they were getting the Meteor ready to fly as the jet fighter and it was going to have a, an outgrowth of the Whittle engine in it but it wasn't ready so the Meteor first flew with two Goblin engines in it. Oh wow! Well so that's something, see, so that history uh, of the actual airframe a lot of people just don't get today. I mean, I mean I'm, I'm 63 hmm. and, and, and I had no idea about this aircraft. I've seen all the footage and stuff. Yeah. Tell me, it used to burn up the tarmac. What's that all about? Well, the, uh, the, uh, if you probably look at the aircraft, you can see that the tail pipe slopes downwards. Uh, sitting a bit nose up, the tail pipe slopes downwards. And that points the jet blast at the tarmac. Restoring this, the vampire, is because that's where your heart was. Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, when I first arrived at Haas, this was sitting here looking all forlorn and unloved, and the project had stopped. There had been some people working on it previously, and they had left, and it was sitting there not going anywhere. And I said to the president, Bob Delahunty, oh, if that project ever gets going again, I wouldn't mind helping out. And about a year later, he came along to me and said, well, it's all yours, get on with it, I want to see some progress. And uh, so we've been working on it ever since. Yeah, and, good. Uh, I'm very much enjoying it. So you're based in Canberra, so you can't be here every weekend no, and that sort no. of thing. So it's it's quite a um, uh, if sort of a task, really, isn't it? To have one life away and then come here every what three weeks? Every three it? weeks. Yeah. yeah, we come down for three days every three weeks. So we average about a day a week working on it. So that's, progress is a bit slow, but uh, I mean it's an all volunteer organisation, and uh, we're getting there. We're almost we're almost there. Yeah. You're one of the f few guys left in the country who knows anything about these, when you think about it. Well, I guess so, but uh, yeah, I did, I did work on them initially when I was an engine fitter, and, uh, and when I came back here, it, uh, a lot of it fell into place, and of course when, you, when you're flying it, you get to know the aeroplane pretty well as well. My There's a lot to be said about guys who start their career as an engineer, like you did, yep. 15, yep. and then you've actually graduated into flying them, yep. which is another thing. So I remember you, when we were talking about this, that um, you started in the trainer of the vampire, yeah. right? So you're sitting with somebody else. Yeah. What about when you got into the Sabre? Well, the Sabre, the, the, uh, I mean, there's some funny things about the Sabre. The, the things they used to do in those days, they would never do these days. Um, to learn to taxi, it had nose wheel steering, and you, uh, 
you had to go for some practice taxiing on with the sabre. So this very brave instructor used to stand on the wing uh, while you started the aircraft up and you'd taxi around and sometimes people would forget uh, to hold the button and engage the nose wheel steering and, uh, and they'd have a bit of a panic and they'd have to put on the, put on the brakes to, to stop it running off the taxiway and the four old instructor nearly get thrown off the wing. But, uh, <laughs> So from there you went, uh, you, you, they had a sort of a simulator, procedural training like a simulator, you did some, um, some time in that and then uh, you hopped into the Sabre and there was another instructor flying another Sabre and he taxied out with you and you lined up on the runway and it was pretty trepidatious, <laughs> uh, put it up to full power, released the brakes and I, it still sticks in my mind that uh, by the time we'd left the concrete, which is not, not very far, uh, onto the main runway on the takeoff, uh, we were already doing 50 knots and that was quite a contrast to the Vampire which took a while to, to, to get, get the speed up. Yeah, yeah. right, right. Uh, in my life I, I spent some time in, in Thailand up near to where you were. Mm -hmm. Were you protecting Thailand there for a stage? Yeah, we, uh, we, we had a squadron of eight Sabres up there, a 70, number 79 squadron, based at Ubon Ratchatani. Um, and we were there, I think, under the terms of the Southeast Asia Treaty Organisation um, for the air defence of Thailand. So we... The airfield at Yubon in southeastern Thailand has now been added to the long list of overseas bases where men and machines of the Royal Australian Air Force have made their mark. On June the 1st, 1962, number 79 squadron flew from Singapore to this small airfield in Thailand. Australia had been quick to respond to a Southeast Asia Treaty Organisation request for forces to be stationed in Thailand when that country appealed for assistance. During the Second World War, No. 79 Fighter Squadron operated from Pacific Island bases. The squadron was disbanded in November 1945, but was reformed in Singapore in May 1962 when the CETO appeal was made. Equipped with Australian-built Sabre jet fighters, the squadron was in Thailand within a matter of days. So we maintained... Uh two sabres all the time at a five minute alert on the end of the runway, fully armed um, with live ammunition and live sidewinder missiles um, and uh, we were occasionally scrambled at unknown targets crossing the border but uh, they, uh, they generally turned out to be something benign. Like the Americans? Yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> forgot to tell everybody. I saw the magnitude of the tasks they were doing in all sorts of shapes and sizes. D describe some of this stuff. Okay, so here we have a, a collection of what we call 3D reference models. <laughs> okay, when you're rebuilding a, an aeroplane from World War II, you can, it's very handy to have the original factory drawings, but it's also very handy to have an original part or parts thereof, or even a whole airframe if you can find one and where they needed parts for old aircraft, literally remanufacturing them from scratch. It is an incredible operation. Um, and, and then to hear of the size of the storage that they have at parks, with all sorts of parts and, and bits and pieces of old aircraft, where they are going to be able to keep this museum fed for a considerable period of time. And, and some of the plans uh, for the future, which if it was anyone other than Bob running it, uh, you'd be inclined to say they're dreaming. But I have absolutely no doubt, having seen what they're doing now, that they will achieve it. We're all loaded up, I'm going to go up to Bankstown and get those F-27 parts. Terrific, that would be great when you do see Steve, we know about the 580, all the engineers we've got coming aboard, we can get it out of there as fast as possible, so it's all go. So we'll do. Know that. Pass it on. Thank Thanks, you. Bob. So this was the baby you loved the most, yeah? Yeah, that's right. No, I really enjoyed flying the Mirage. Yeah. Out of Butterworth. Was that interesting up that part of the world? To fly oh, these? 
Oh, it was. I mean, at Butterworth, some of the interesting things was we used to do intercept practice at night, and there were big thunderstorms up around Butterworth often, and uh, that made it very interesting. A replica of Kingsford Smith's Southern Cross with broken landing gear was forced to make an emergency landing at Parafield Airport. After burning off its full load of fuel, the pilots of the wooden canvas plane touched down on one good wheel and managed to bring it to a halt safely. Incredibly, no one was injured. The pilots praised for their skill. They're doing this amazing job rebuilding the Southern Cross. Southern Cross. I'm absolutely staggered at the quality of the woodwork yeah. that has gone into that rebuild. Do they have the capability to do these things? I have absolutely no doubt. There are a, lot, a lot of people keen to see this, this aeroplane back in the air again and um, it'll be a good, uh, a good sister ship to the 7 mm -hmm. how many, How much more work do you have? I know it's taken a while. Uh, well, basically, the engines are the biggest issue at the moment. Uh, once we rewire the engines, which we're almost there, um, we pretty well wired most of number one and number two, and now we're just starting to get back on number three. Uh, so there's a little bit more work to go, and that uh, a lot of little fiddly stuff now. So, uh, but we'll get there. We'll get there soon. I heard, I heard you labelling one of the wires just now as a starter. <laughs> Correct. Uh, yep. That's good. Correct. Yeah. 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 Correct. <laughs> That's good stuff. We don't have to hand swing this prop. We don't like VODs. <laughs> uh, welcome aboard AJA, kindly gifted to the Haas uh, Museum by uh, Qantas. This is the uh, record setting jumbo that flew from uh, London to Australia in 1989 and set the record in uh, 20 hours, 9 minutes, and 5 seconds and uh, came to. Haas in uh, 2015. So if you come to visit at Haas, we uh, have premium tours where an experienced former Qantas pilot like myself uh, will take you uh, through the operation of the flight deck. You can see the jumbo here. Uh, you can also go in the holes. Uh, Ex-Qantas uh, engineers will take you uh, through the main electronic control panel underneath uh, the main uh, bay and also in through the uh, cargo areas. And we also have our experienced former cabin crew can take you uh, through the main cabin and the upper deck and explain to you how we uh, used to operate the aircraft on uh, long range flights. Uh, if you could also do wing walks, uh, we've started wing walks again with the easing of uh, COVID restrictions. Uh, if we get up six people at a time out on the right hand wing and uh, it's quite, probably going to be quite a long day for you so we also have a wonderful Connie Cafe where you can have a great cup of coffee and they also make some wonderful home-cooked uh, style meals for you where you and your friends can uh, relax and also you can do an hour and a half uh, tour through the museum with our experienced tour guides we have many many historical aircraft including the famous constellation with still flyers caribous which fly uh, also the uh, famous DC-3 C-47s which also fly and you can see many historical aircraft like the F-111 that was gifted to us by the Air Force and uh, you can sit in the uh, cockpit of the uh, F-111, see what it was like to fly in a, a fighter bomber at uh, Mach 2.5. There's some uh, great uh, old historical aircraft we also have from the Navy, now including the Grumman uh, Tracker. So once again, we'd like to welcome you uh, to Haas, and uh, you and your family will also be made uh, very welcome here, and I uh, hope to see you soon. I must say, I was absolutely delighted that OJA ended up at Haas and it could not have been in a better place. Good afternoon, Anne Sanders. We're breaking into programming to bring you a very special moment. You're watching the last in the Qantas 747 fleet, flying high over Sydney. It's its final journey as it makes its way to America and its final resting place in the Mojave Desert. On board is Captain Quinn, who said this morning it's been a wonderful part of our history, a truly groundbreaking aircraft and while we're very sad to see our last one go, it's doing a flyover today, up over the harbour and back again. It'll then sweep down to Albion Park before making its way to America. Can only imagine how Captain Quinn must be feeling today. She's been flying these 747s for 36 years now, so very poignant moment. One that we all knew was coming because uh, Qantas has long stated its intention to retire the entire 747 fleet, but a day that's come a lot sooner than many of us had expected. Qantas announced less than a month ago that it would be bringing forward the retirement of the six 
six final 747s from the end of this year to now um, because of course of the coronavirus pandemic and the effect that that has had on the airline. Uh, It's it's hard to know, Tim. Um, it, it is a magnificent aeroplane in its own right. Um, strangely enough, um, that big lump of aluminium and titanium um, has a very special part in my psyche, obviously. Um, but I guess to the people who are going to tour the aircraft, um, my recommendation would be to enjoy the majesty of that beast and to think of the engineering skills that enable Boeing to build it and build it so successfully. <laughs> 